In addition to seeing patients on the inpatient neurology service, I'm also the uh, medical director for the uh, tubervascular ultrasound lab um, and one of the interpreting physicians for uh, carotid Doppler and for transcranial Doppler, which is the subject of uh, today's talk. Uh, and the reason I've placed this very macabre looking photo up here, uh, I was thinking as I, I came in uh, about TCD and uh, people who are enthusiastic about TCD and how weird they are about skulls. Uh, Colleen DeVille, who you may know, is the direct is the uh, the clinical director of the uh, uh, the ultrasound lab. Um, she and I went to uh, Prague this last April for the uh, European uh, Neurosynology uh, uh, annual meeting, and uh, it was. In Prague, and outside of Prague, there's this monastery called the Sedlitz Monastery, and they have this thing called the Kosnitsa or, or, or Bone Church. And some crazy monks uh, in medieval times took all of the bones buried there and put them into weird coat of arms, geometrical shapes, candelabras, and these are all real bones. And uh, so people come there to, uh, to to view these things. Everybody else is, you know, enjoying the whimsical poses of the skeletons and the uh, artwork created from this, and Colleen is there as a sonographer of, you know, 30 years, just looking at every skull, wondering where the temporal window is going to be, and where she'd apply the probe to that particular skull. So it's a very unusual subculture of people who get into this, and then they get into strange fascinations with the human skull and uh, how to get sound waves through it. And that's what we're going to talk about today and specifically how we use this modality uh, in the diagnostic workup of ischemic stroke. Uh, alas, yes, unfortunately, nothing to disclose. No one will give me anything, but I'm open to. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the uh, stages of accepting TCD into your life as a vascular neurologist. It's a, it's a process. Uh, what, uh, what it allows us to do that is unique, and the main thing I want to do is demonstrate that through some clinical cases that I've uh, seen over my, uh, my time here at, uh, at Swedish. So TCD is a, is a strange bird. Uh, you don't see it uh, in every institution, and uh, as a neurologist in training, you might not see it at all. And if you do see it, you might be baffled by why it's here and what it's good for. And so you go through some stages before coming to uh, an acceptance of TCD as part of your life. And the first one is, is shock and denial. Uh, having a passing familiarity with body ultrasound, being able to do things through the skin and look at carotid arteries, that all seems reasonable. But getting enough sound energy through uh, the skull uh, in order to, uh, to see the vessels uh, at the uh, center of that bony box seems a little far-fetched, um, as it did to me when I was a, uh, a neurology intern. Uh, but indeed, and this is fairly, uh, a fairly new revelation, it was only in the, uh, the early 80s that this uh, technology came into uh, usage. Um, and they discover that indeed it is possible uh, with a two megahertz probe to uh, get a signal uh, in most skulls uh, looking through the temporal window uh, just in front of the ear uh, and be able to generate a, uh, a spectral waveform and then uh, make conclusions based upon the velocities and the morphology of that, uh, that waveform. So the more, uh, so the main window we use to look at the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries is the temporal window, and that can be highly variable in what the thinnest portion of that bone is, and so the sonographer has to be very uh, diligent uh, and very patient in order to find that optimal window to get the best uh, spectral waveform. And it could be very anterior, it can be very posterior, uh, and it can be very hard to hold on to it once you get it. There are three other windows that we use for inserting the uh, transorbital window uh, to look at the carotid siphon as well as the ophthalmic artery. The frame and magnum allows us to look at the uh, distal vertebral arteries and the basilar artery. And then we use the retromandibular uh, window uh, to look at the, um, the distal uh, internal carotid as well. <clears throat> 
Uh, the other reason it's easy to deny the pertinence of TCD is it's really tough to find a place that has a cadre of skilled technologists uh, who do it. In most places, there's somebody who does body imaging who happens to have a uh, passing knowledge of TCD, and they'll come in a couple days a week and do the subarachnoid patients. And so not being exposed to it is a common feature as a, as a training neurologist. Uh, so after you accept that it in fact exists, uh, it's, a, it's a frustrating go of it uh, because you're already getting used to looking at brain MRIs, at vascular imaging with CT angiograms, MR angiograms, uh, looking at the pictures the interventionists make with their catheters. And here's a whole other thing that looks different. It's weird. It makes noise. And you really don't want to deal with it when you're a trainee. And so uh, that's... Uh, that's something you have to get over as well. But as you learn about it, you realize that it's got uh, a multitude of potential uh, utilities. Uh, most commonly, it's used uh, for vasospasm detection in patients with uh, uh, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, it's also uh, widely used in pediatrics for kids with sickle cell anemia uh, and judging when to give uh, transfusions by uh, a velocity uh, cutoff in the middle cerebral arteries. Uh, but you can look at intracranial stenosis, uh, you can use it for brain death examinations, you can use it to detect emboli from plaques, you can monitor during uh, cardinodirectomy to look to see if you need to shunt or not. Um, you can look, use it to detect uh, PFOs, you can use it for um, dynamic compression of the vertebral artery, subclavian steel, uh, ICP monitoring, and some feel even for lysing clots and aiding uh, TPA and getting to the, uh, uh, the center of a clot by, uh, by oscillating the, uh, the thrombus itself. So once you've accepted, yes, that uh, there, is, there is some use for this uh, technology, then you're faced with a dilemma. If you really want to get facile at interpreting it, you have to, and become certified interpreting it, you have to go back to physics again, which if you've already gone through your uh, you know, prelims for, uh, for medical school and put all that behind you, it's a, it's a grim realization that you have to go back and start thinking about this again and actually discuss seriously with someone in the Fraunhofer zone, which I really hadn't planned on doing. But the things that are really the essentials uh, in physics uh, are just a couple things uh, in order to really derive what we do with uh, transcranial Doppler. One is the uh, higgin pusos law, uh, which um, shows the components of, uh, of what determines flow. There's a couple of constants there. The length of the vessel is important in the denominator, as well as the viscosity that's uh, described by eta constant. The preferal pressure differential, but by far the most important thing is the uh, radius, uh, which as you can see there is the fourth power. So the, the, the size of the vessel, the, the caliber, really determines the flow. And again, we're not measuring flow, per se, with, uh, with TCD. We're measuring uh, flow velocity. So it's, it's, we're extrapolating uh, information about volume flow. But in fact, we're just getting the speed of movement, because at any given time with the TCD, we don't know the exact, uh, the exact caliber by measurement of the vessel. So it's uh, uh, a surrogate for, uh, for flow. But it's, 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 it's fairly, uh, fairly accurate. And then the other uh, important principle, uh, if you really to water down the physics, is the continuity principle, which states that if you have the same uh, volume flowing uh, in a tube, uh, if that tube uh, becomes a different diameter, uh, the volume, ha the velocity of that flow has to change in a way that's inversely proportional. So if you've got a big tube, it's going to go slower. If that same volume goes through a small tube, it's got to go faster to move the same volume. And that's essentially. Uh, how we make conclusions about vessel stenosis and vasospasm and things of that sort. Velocities go up, that means the vessel's getting narrower. Or there's less resistance at the other end, or you're anemic, or a few other things. So you gotta be, you gotta accept TCD on its own terms. There's other things that affect that as well. But we make the assumption that uh, most of that velocity change is based upon the diameter of the vessel. So once you've gotten through the physics part and, uh, and swallowed that bitter pill, uh, you go through a f long stage of depression because you're like, I really get TCD, I want to use it, and I want to do hands-on. And you discover how hard it is to get that temporal window and actually maintain a good waveform with your shaking you know, uh, 
vascular neurology fellow, too much coffee hand uh, on the side of the patient's head. And it seemed like every single patient I did, this was what my report looked like. Uh, and that, you know, we got looked through the bone, couldn't see anything, and uh, we'll have to use another modality to look at those vessels. At which point the sonographer comes in and within two seconds finds a beautiful left MCA signal and you hang your head and, and walk out of the room to go get more coffee. Uh, the, admittedly, there are disadvantages of transcranial Doppler. Uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of patients have inadequate temporal windows. Again, that's highly dependent upon who's doing it. Uh, how you perform the study uh, and how much experience you have uh, really affects the outcome as well. We're extremely lucky here at Swedish to have the sonographers we have. And uh, as I mentioned before, there's other things that can affect the velocities and waveforms that are that are not uh, velocity uh, that are not um, diameter of the vessel, the caliber of the vessel, uh, cardiac status, um, you can have a patient with very severe aortic valve insufficiency, it can look like a brain death exam where the diastole totally disappears because of all the uh, regurgitation into the heart, and hematocrit can affect it well, so you have a patient with a hematocrit of, of 19, all their velocities are going to be up uh, as the brain parenchyma responds to that um, uh, lower oxygen tension. But then eventually, you get to the point, and I apologize for all the Loki stuff, my daughter is like a huge Marvel Cinematic Universe fan, and she insisted that I put Loki into my talk, and so I'm, uh, this, is, this is for her, her benefit, but I, I like Loki too, I have to admit. Uh, and so the, the advantages you get with TCD are that it's cheaper than, than MRA and CT angiogram, it's portable, it can be done at the bedside, we do them in the OR. Uh, it can be done in the ICU. It's very low risk. Uh, there's no radiation or contrast agents. And most importantly, it's repeatable. You can do it a couple times a day. Uh, you can do it directly after an intervention. You can make a therapeutic change and repeat it again. Uh, and it, it's got a huge utility in that, uh, in that regard. Uh, and I think that's really where its main advantage lies. So I'd like to switch right into ischemic stroke cases. And please stop me during this if I say something that sounds strange or you need further clarification, because I get all excited about it and then I forget that not everyone finds this as exciting as I do. So I think one of the best uses of transcardial Doppler is looking at how the brain uh, recruits collaterals in order to uh, compensate for stenoocclusive disease. So here is a 57-year-old guy with the usual uh, package of uh, stroke risk factors, who has a uh, transient episode of uh, right-sided uh, arm weakness, mild aphasia, uh, and he comes in for an evaluation. So what we're looking at here is a uh, transcranial Doppler imaging study. There are, there's non-imaging, which has been the typical mainstay, and more recently they combine uh, it's, it's, it's a duplex, so it's got the B mode, so you can look at structures through the skull, which looks pretty grainy, like a polar bear in a snowstorm, but you can make out uh, if you really concentrate hard. Oh, I could use my, my thing here. This is the, uh, the sphenoid ridge right here, so the, the, the skull is right here. We're incidating toward the midline here, uh, and the, uh, the, the midbrain is right here, sphenoid ridge, and this thing you're seeing right here is the right middle cerebral artery, looking through the right uh, temporal window. And this is uh, where they have the sample right here between those two bars is where you generate this uh, spectral window. And this is a typical looking uh, intracranial waveform uh, where you have a systolic acceleration, you can see a dichrotic notch, and then you have diastole. And like everywhere in the brain, uh, unlike the rest of the body, there's always forward flow in diastole. It doesn't drop below the midline. If it does, that's very abnormal. The brain likes to have its blood flow all the time. And so if you see anything besides that, there's something wrong. Uh, so if we go a little further through that same temporal window, uh, this is the MCA here, and then we're a little deeper toward the midline, and you see this other vessel. Uh, and you see an important difference that uh, now the waveform is below the line, which means it's moving away from the probe. And so that uh, is consistent with a anterior cerebral artery. So the terminal ICA is right here. You got anterior going this way. You got middle cerebral artery going this way. Uh, 
Uh, but what's unusual here, again, the waveform morphology looks normal, but you can see that the, uh, the mean velocity is much higher than it was in the MCA, and that's abnormal. There's a hierarchy of normal velocities uh, in intracranial circulation. MCA is always highest, then ACA, then PCA, then basilar, then vertebral. And that hierarchy is all, always maintained unless there's collateral being recruited or there's a stenosis or spasm. Uh, so that's already unusual, uh, and typically uh, what this means is that this uh, ACA is either stenotic or it's a donor vessel. It's providing more flow because it's helping out the other side. Now we're looking at the uh, left temporal window. Uh, it's a similar view here, and you can see another middle cerebral artery. The waveform looks different here. You can see that the mean velocity is lower. The systolic uptake is slower and the diastole is a little higher. It's kind of a blunted waveform, and that indicates that there's proximal uh, stenosis uh, creating that, uh, that waveform. Again, this is a, Sorry, yes? Is the velocity hierarchical because of the diameter of the artery? Um, I, they are hierarchical uh, because of the, uh, the demand in each of those uh, territories. It is larger as well. Right. So I would think the velocity in the ACA would be higher, but then there's a demand issue. Yeah, and the uh, and, and part of it is made up of you know, like all the distal arterioles and how they uh, they dilate uh, for um, for demand of whatever that function is uh, on that side of the brain, and so the overall diameter downstream can be much can be much higher in that. Uh, in that part of the brain, because it's feeding such a large, uh, a large part of the brain, um, and so the uh, the, re the resistance uh, also might be lower on the other end of the tube in those. But that's uh, within normal uh, subjects. Uh, that hierarchy, uh, in the absence of stenoocclusive disease, is always maintained. Right. Doctor Duell. Can of worms here. Uh, <laughs> questions, but uh, that demand variance. Yes. That become an issue. Behaviors not that much. It's not as uh, it's it's not as sensitive as your modality for that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but there, uh, I'll I'll show a case in a little bit where there, there is a uh, a hint of a functional TCD exam. If you if you move your leg, you get a bigger. Yeah, but I mean, you think about like how much cortex it is compared to the entire uh, territory being irrigated by that vessel. It's pretty negligible, yeah. and so it, it's it's. Use that. Yeah, I think it'd be tougher. You'd have to be very, very, very sensitive, uh, Mark. There's so many other things that affect the, the velocity that I think that would be tough to pull off. But I do have one example that touches on that, on that point. So if moving deeper on the left window, you see the, uh, the ACA, but you see a striking difference in this one uh, in that uh, instead of going away from the probe as it should to go toward the midline, uh, it's going backwards. So that right ACA was indeed a donor vessel uh, feeding the, uh, the opposite hemisphere via the anterior communicator uh, over to the, uh, to the left side. That's a nice shot. If you have a nice type of window, you can see the whole, the whole circle of Willis. So here's uh, uh, left, a a uh, left ACA, left MCA, and then again, the uh, midbrain is right here, and you have the first uh, segment of the, P of the PCA and then the opposite hemisphere PCA here. Turning to the orbital window in the same patient, if you look on the right, you see a uh, traditional uh, ophthalmic artery uh, waveform, which is slightly higher resistance because it's blood flow to the eyeball, uh, and then toward the probe. So this is the, the first real branch of the ICA intracranially going out to the eyeball. If you go to the other side, you see that it's uh, the opposite. You have um, flow going away from the probe, so the branches of the external artery are uh, communicating with the ophthalmic artery and flowing retrograde back into the brain uh, to feed the uh, left hemisphere, which is not doing so hot because of a carotid problem. You also see that there's a lower resistance waveform. It's a much more flat, blunted waveform, uh, and it looks more like blood flow to the brain rather than blood flow to the eyeball. <laughs> 
And so indeed, if we turn to the, uh, the neck, here's uh, the waveform in the, uh, the distal uh, common carotid artery. Uh, here's the uh, external carotid artery, which has a typical uh, high resistance waveform, deep dichrotic notch, uh, very steep systolic upstroke, and a low diastole, because it's feeding the face and the scalp mainly. Um, and then the ICA is silent. And so this is a patient with a occluded uh, left ICA, and then the what I call the complete compensation package of uh, right to left shunt via ACOM, uh, exterior uh, to interior collateral via the ophthalmic artery, uh, and then also the, uh, the posterior cerebral artery is uh, providing posterior to anterior collateral. If the first segment of the PCA is 25% higher than the proximal MCA, again, violating that hierarchy, we assume that there's uh, posterior to anterior via the, the posterior communicating artery. If the higher velocity is in the P2 segment, we assume that it's leptomeningeal collaterals that are helping out the MCA territory. Case number two. So it's a 71-year-old guy with uh, uh, the usual, uh, usual stuff we see on our service, um, has headache and neck pain, and he's got something wrong with his left vertebral artery. And the question is, is it totally occluded, or is there still residual flow? And if so, is there something we should do about it? And so here's a shot of a cervical Doppler of the left uh, vertebral artery in its proximal segment. And uh, this is atypical in that it's very high resistance. It's got a very low diastole, deep dichrotic notch, which is indicative of resistance, that there's a, there's a stenosis or an occlusion um, further up the, uh, the vertebral artery, and indeed there is a dropout of signal. Uh, and this is the, the venous signal. Again, the vein is below the line. It looks very flat like this, but no arterial signal um, seen with uh, the distal segment. This is uh, transcranial Doppler through the frame and magnum, so the probe is, is up here, uh, the back of the neck looking up, and so everything's a little upside down here. And what you see here is the right vertebral artery uh, and its confluence with the basilar heading up this way. And those are going away from the probe as they should. And here you have the V4 segment of the left vertebral artery uh, flowing retrograde. And so the V4 is reversed in order to feed the pica territory. Um, and this indicates that indeed the vessel is completely uh, occluded and it is uh, gaining collateral from retrograde flow from the basilar. Here's another case uh, with a 64-year-old female who had uh, vertigo and left lower extremity uh, weakness. Uh, here's an MRI uh, that shows this little inferior pontine infarct, dark on the ADC as well. And her CT angiogram shows uh, a dropout of contrast in the uh, mid basilar See, there it is, there it isn't, there it is, there it isn't. And the question is, is this you know, a critical stenosis, uh, or is it, totally, is it totally occluded? And the, uh, this is a non-imaging TCD. Uh, TCD can, can answer this question for you, uh, because unlike MRAs and CTAs, it shows you direction uh, of flow. And so here's the, the basilar signal, again, going in the proximal portion. The basilar runs from about a depth of 75, 80 millimeters up to 110, getting to the apex of the, uh, of the artery. And that should all be away from the probe, uh, heading up toward the top of the, uh, the basilar and the confluence with the PCAs. But as you see, we get, up down, we get to 100 uh, millimeters, and now the flow is coming back toward the, uh, the probe again. And so the basilar apex is reversed. Uh, in order to fill uh, the upper perforating branches and prevent more stroke. Uh, here's a shot of the right terminal ICA in the same uh, patient. And if you follow that posteriorly, uh, they actually get a nice shot of their uh, posterior communicating artery flowing backwards. Uh, when these are recruited, typically they're, uh, they're higher velocity and they have uh, turbulent flow, which is what this bright thing at the bottom of the spectrum uh, is here, because it's a vessel that's not used to being used and it gets recruited. Um, and uh, the uh, initial flow looks uh, very uh, disturbed. And then if you get to the back of the posterior communicator, you find the first segment of the PCA. Again, this is the 
midbrain right here and the top of the basilar should be right here and it's going backwards. That should be flowing out and out to the occipital lobe. Instead, it's flowing backwards and that's how the upper basilary perforators and superior cerebral arteries are getting their flow in this patient uh, from a reversed basilar artery. Then the PCA, uh, the second segment of the PCA is going out back like it's supposed to. Any questions on that so far? So just for, for uh, occlusion, mm -hmm. how does the sensitivity of TCD compare to other modalities like CTA or MRA? For, for like a, for a, um, uh, like for a carotid occlusion or for, for, for any occlusion? I think it gives you really helpful uh, information that you can't get from some of those other modalities. MRA, particularly the time of flight, is notorious for having a dropout in signal when there's still flow there. So it gets below a certain threshold and just disappears. Uh, I think CT angiogram is superior to, um, uh, to MRA in that regard. But we get some of these people like, is it a string sign? Is it actually dropping out there? If you actually see residual flow, uh, or if you have someone who has uh, what appears to be occlusion in the bulb and you see antegrade flow through the orbital window in the siphon, you know it's not totally occluded. There's still flow getting through there. It can also be helpful when those, study, those studies, those other modalities overcall a stenosis and it says, oh, that looks like it's in like, you know, the, you know, you know, 68% by NASA criteria. But then you look for, a, you know, collateral and there's no, dis no disruption of the waveform um, there's no uh, circle Willis collateralization, and when we do the, the cervical Doppler, by velocity criteria, it's actually less than 50%. And that happens frequently when the, there's a very calcified uh, vessel in the neck. And so I think it can be a, a complementary uh, uh, modality. And for occlusion, to go back to that question, there's a particular proximal signal, this kind of thump waveform that we see that's, that's uh, um, uh, that's, that's consistent with an occlusion that uh, is, is a feature you can't get with the, the, those others as well. So I, I think they're complementary, uh, and I feel very confident if I have one of those modalities that looks like occlusion, and then I confirm it with a, with a, a Doppler technique, uh, calling that an occluded vessel. But sometimes we find that it's not. So is it standard? I think the standard, the standard of care probably in most institutions would, still be to get a, would be to get a catheter angiogram. If it's a carotid and you're considering revascularizing, is it occluded, is it a string sign, that would be that. I think this is, this is a, a reasonable uh, alternative. Um, but uh, I don't, uh, in the, uh, the greater vascular neurology community, uh, I think that's still a, a debated issue. Uh, one more collateral case here is that this is a young lady uh, who had uh, three weeks of uh, neck pain, headache, and tinnitus, and now comes in with uh, acute vertigo, gait ataxia, and left-sided uh, dysesthesias. And she has a little Wallenberg stroke here on the, on the right. It's already visible on uh, flare imaging. And this is a coronal uh, CT angiogram. You can see there's a little petering out of uh, vessel caliber in the right V3 segment of the vertebral artery. There's uh, abnormal uh, lumen on the opposite side. And down here, there was not terribly stenotic, but also a, a dissection uh, lower. And at least two of these were, uh, were acute. You can, this is a uh, uh, fat saturation T1 MRI, and you can see the, uh, the halo sign in the, uh, the, the distal right vertebral artery here. And then more proximally, uh, in the left side, you have another acute dissection. And she had what looked like a, uh, a, a fetal variant PCA on the left, and uh, a tiny little posterior communicator uh, was seen on the right, not with the, the MRA though. Um, and you can see that the, uh, here's a great example of like how flow can make it look like you have total dropout here. The, uh, the vertebral artists look pretty wimpy coming in because the time of flight is not capturing much signal. So she has, uh, she's in the ICU, she's got fluctuating uh, severity of vertigo and changing uh, degree of, um, of uh, a wakefulness, 
And so here's our basilar artery going through the, the frame and magnum at a depth of 90 millimeters. And you have a fairly normal looking uh, waveform here. Um, and then periodically, without much change in depth, you see this waveform here, and this, this, is, this is the M mode, which I'll discuss in, a, uh, in another case, is kind of a sampling of multiple depths at once. And where the yellow line is, is where you're, you're, uh, uh, you're making your spectral waveform from this particular uh, sample depth. Uh, but you get an idea of like what the flow is. It's all blue, it's all going away from the probe as it should, but then there's a dropout right here. And when we see an intracranial vessel that has a drop to baseline, that's usually a precursor to oscillating flow, where there's actually alternating um, flow. We can see that in subclavian steel syndrome, and we call that hesitant flow. Uh, and it's usually what comes before actual alternating flow or reversal of flow. Uh, but so she was just laying there in bed, and she'd go from having this waveform here to this waveform here, to this waveform here, to this waveform here. And uh, Chrislyn Barnhart, who you may know, was the sonographer, and she's like, what is it that makes it change like that? Because it seemed to be very consistent. And she finally noticed that it was a particular behavior the patient was doing that changed the, uh, the waveform morphology. So can anyone guess what it is? Head turning. Wasn't head turning. It's the basilar. <laughs> it was actually eye opening and eye closure. Uh, so, the uh, whenever, whenever she had her eyes closed, uh, it had this waveform. With, right. So whenever she opened her eyes, this is like this is her with her eyes closed here, and the uh, the occipital lobe is not uh, the the cortex is not active at that at that point, and then when she when she. Uh, opens her eyes and those arterioles uh, dilate, they lower the resistance and she's able to overcome the stenosis and uh, demand more flow and that hesitancy goes away. And she said it was very con consistent every time she had her open or close her eyes, the, the waveform would change. So this is an exa extreme example where you can get a little bit of functional TCD. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like you know, what the, the, the background rhythm on the, uh, on the yeah. EEG with the opening and closing. But it's, 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 very, it's very gross things like that that you can, you can detect with the, the TCD. But this was kind of a signal that this territory was uh, at risk and, and having uh, issues with, uh, with demand. You don't see MCA, like left MCA changes. Again, it's such a huge territory um, that uh, is being irrigated by that vessel that, uh, you know, if we, if we could actually selectively insulate smaller branches, I'm sure we could. And the people have looked at it. Uh, but again, it's a it's a it's a sensitivity issue, Mike. Right. We're looking at the basilar artery. Okay. So the next day, she has an episode of tunnel vision. She has worsening dysesthesias on the left. The TCD is repeated, and now that hesitant flow you can see here in the uh, the M mode uh, with each cardiac cycle is there all the time, regardless of what. Uh, what her eyelids are doing. Uh, and as we go more distal, or at 86 millimeters, get up to 90, and now the apex of the basilar is reversed. This was anterograde before. And so over time, uh, she's had to recruit retrograde uh, flow in the basilar in order, to, uh, in order to feed the basilar perforators. So the cool thing about TCD is that since you can do it multiple times a day and it's portable, you can actually see dynamic things and respond to them instead of you know, sending somebody down to a CTA, which will only show you a static picture of the basilar and won't tell you which, which direction it's going. So it's, it's, a, it's an advantage for people like this who are in a, a fragile uh, hemodynamic state. There at the, more toward the apex, it's retrograde. So at this point, they're con concerned that uh, you know, she's got a fragile, uh, collateral situation, and that uh, maybe we need to stent one of these uh, critically stenosed uh, dissected vertebral arteries. Uh, and so, meanwhile, she's starting to get a little bit better. We get it again, and we see that uh, the basilar artery uh, is now antegrade again, uh, and the hesitant flow is not there anymore. In fact, the whole thing looks a lot better, and she starts waking up, uh, and uh, her vertigo is getting better. 
And they do end up doing a diagnostic angiogram, and uh, this is her second one. And what was not here before was this uh, collateral, these uh, muscular collaterals that are feeding the, uh, the distal vertebral artery on the left uh, to make up for this critical stenosis uh, from, the, uh, from the dissection. So over several days, she was able to recruit enough collateral to, to make up for this. Uh, and the TCD kind of captured it in the process of happening. Uh, and that last bit uh, reassured us and uh, made us decide against uh, placing a, a stent in this young lady. How are we doing for time? For good? Okay. I'll just keep going ahead. Um, this, is a, this is a great and classic consultation. We just want neurology's blessing. That's all we want for this. Like, we think we know the answer, but we just want your blessing, which is great. 76-year-old guy, hypertension, dyslipidemia, coronary disease, former smoker, uh, prior endoterectomy on the right, uh, developed a transient episode of his right arm being completely flaccid, got better. Uh, already had a Doppler as an outpatient with showed severe left ICA stenosis. Vascular surgeries admitted him to get an endoterectomy. Uh, neurology just need your blessing. I was like, wow, this is like going to take 10 minutes. This is the easiest case ever. I don't have the images from their study. Uh, there are multiple uh, criteria that are used. There's a standardized one that uh, we should all be using until they change it again. But this is the, uh, the money part of the study here. Uh, the peak systolic velocity in the left ICA is 474. The end diastolic is 209. Our cutoffs for severe grade stenosis, 70 to 99 percent, is 230. For end diastolic, it's 100. And then the ratio is typically greater than four ICA to CCA ratio, and it's 6.2 uh, in this patient. So meeting all criteria for a severe stenosis in the left ICA. And they even got an MRI, though I would agree, like, I would, I would have argued we didn't even need that, but the MRI was ready too. So this consult's getting easier and easier, because not only do you have the severe stenosis in the clinical phenomenon, but you have a DWI lesion in the left hemisphere. So this thing is like, of course, we'll just do the endoterectomy. And then you get this. Why, why is there two others on the, on the right hemisphere? <clears throat> So that was a bit of a head scratcher. We looked at the echocardiogram. There's a uh, slightly decreased uh, systolic function, some mild uh, valvular abnormalities, um, but uh, nothing striking there. The uh, EKG and the telemetry show a sinus rhythm with, with P waves. So what do I do? I get a TCD. It makes the most sense. And this is the. Uh, Looking at the left uh, ACA, uh, indeed finding what I suspected, which is that it's going toward the probe, which it should not. Uh, and so there's a reversed ACA for right to left collateral. Uh, and here's a blurb on the, uh, the M mode, which again, so here's a map of the, uh, the arteries. And you're going to be seeing all these depths at once, looking from the, uh, the left side. This is all MCA, this red wall, then beyond a depth of uh, 60, you get the, uh, the ACA flow, and then here's midline here, and then beyond that, you get the contralateral uh, anterior cerebral artery if you have a really good temporal window. And then you can sample what level you want. In this case, it would be a left MCA at 50 uh, millimeters. So, so this is... Um, This is looking at the left ACA from the right temporal window. So you're looking all the way across. Uh, and you can see that the uh, left ACA uh, indeed is reversed and heading back toward the uh, left MCA in order to give it flow. Uh, and then all the flow um, in the, the contralateral ACA is, is heading, uh, heading toward that to, to feed the, uh, the contralateral artery. Uh, this one you can see, this is, so this is, I think, uh, around the, the area of the ACOM. You see this very turbulent flow here and a very high velocity. So you can remember the, the ACOM is not really a vessel. It's kind of a fenestration between those, those two arteries. So when you have recruitment of that collateral, uh, it tends to be very, very turbulent. Uh, the ophthalmic uh, on the left uh, is indeed reversed as well with a brain-looking waveform, not an eyeball waveform. And this is a shot of the comparison of the two siphons. The, so the carotid siphon you can see through the orbital window as well. And you can see a difference in the morphology. Here's the normal right side uh, with a uh, steep systolic uptake. And 
you know, kind of um, half of it is the diastole is about half the velocity of the peak systolic. And here you see a much more blunted waveform and a higher diastole um, in a uh, vessel that has a proximal stenosis. And the MCA has a similar uh, waveform that's, that's blunted because of the, uh, the stenosis. PCA, again, is more than 25% higher than the left MCAs. So there's posterior to anterior collateral as well. And it's all summarized in these really handy uh, diagrams that, the, that uh, we make for uh, the ordering physicians. Uh, so you have right to left, you have external to internal, and you have posterior to anterior. The other thing, in case this guy didn't have enough reasons to go after the, uh, uh, the left carotid, uh, you see one of these here. You know what those are? Those are the emboli. Uh, and you can see it has, uh, it's always within the spectrum. And if you look as time goes on, it has a kind of curvilinear uh, uh, shape to it because as, as time moves on, it's moving down the length of the vessel and as you get more shallow, uh, um, uh, as time goes on, it gets more shallow. And so it has, they're never straight up and down. It's straight up and down, it's, a, it's an artifact. And if it curves like this, it's a real uh, embolic signal. So he had those on the left side only. And here's just uh, the criteria for a uh, microembolic signal. They're, uh, they're intense, they're transient. In addition to the uh, visual features they have, they also have a very um, characteristic uh, chirp or snap that you can hear when you're performing the vessel, uh, performing the, the study and looking at the vessel. And here are some examples of what they can look like. They can be very subtle as well. And so what we know about these is in symptomatic carotids, uh, these can be seen in, in, uh, in close to, to half of them. This was a, a study done by Hugh Marcus in the UK. Uh, these are all patients with greater than 50% stenosis. Um, who had had a clinical phenomenon that uh, implicated the, uh, the artery. And the odds ratio of stroke or TIA was 4.6. Uh, and the people who had emboli versus did not have uh, uh, emboli. So if it's a symptomatic carotid, uh, the presence of emboli suggests that it's even a higher risk uh, lesion. And then more importantly, because you're going to take those patients anyway for endarterectomy, for asymptomatic carotid stenosis uh, greater than 50%, uh, uh, the presence of microemboli also uh, portends a higher risk of ipsilateral stroke. Uh, um, uh, compared to those who have no microembolic uh, signals. And for this particular study, it was a hazard risk of at two years of, uh, of five and a half for the presence of emboli and ipsilateral stroke. So all these things seem to be pushing toward the endarterectomy, yet you have this DWI lesion on the other side. So what would you recommend at this point to vascular surgery? Did he have an echo? Did have an echo, too. It looked okay. The systolic was a little, was a little less, uh, was on telemetry. Uh, but uh, nothing, nothing that was a smoking gun for a cardioembolic source. Um, so I was about to call and say, you know, based upon the weight of the TCD evidence, I think we should go ahead and do this anyway. There may be overlapping um, risk factors here. But meanwhile, he made the decision for us. As I was on the phone uh, calling Dr. Lee, uh, the patient had another TIA with right-sided weakness and aphasia. And so that kind of made the decision for us, and he was just taken right to the, uh, the OR. You're, by, by doing a CA on left, you still the risk of embolic, embolic uh, events on the right, actually. On, on, on the right? Yeah, just because of the reversal flow. Oh. So, I mean, it still sounds like it would be the case. Well, I think, I think it's, uh, if it was an asymptomatic carotid, like this may be one of the portion of uh, one of the... Uh, uh, kind of a subset of asymptomatic carotid that it's, it's high grade and it has concerning features. In this case, it's got, it's recruited all the collateral it can, and there's positive emboli. And so this is a case where I think you can make an argument that if there were no DBUI lesions and no clinical phenomenon, maybe it should be done anyway. That's a great use of TCD. And it's a, and it's a, <laughs> that's the main, if you take, a, take away no other point from this talk, it's a great <laughs> use of TCD. Uh, it makes a really cool study. What about PAF? Yeah. 
He certainly could. Yeah. That's that's the chronic question that plagues the, the stroke neurologists. Uh, stay tuned. So he gets an endoterectomy and uh, gets a TCD afterwards. And the reason this is cool is you can see now the uh, left ACA is going the way it should, uh, away from the probe. Uh, the left ophthalmic is now feeding the eyeball instead of the brain, as it should. Uh, and the uh, waveforms uh, don't look blunted anymore. In fact, they look quite the opposite. And this is actually a concerning thing that TCD can be helpful for post endoterectomy. Uh, when the mean velocities are really high ipsilateral to the endoterectomy, uh, the PCA is now obeying the hierarchy again. It's now less than the uh, ipsilateral MCA. When you see velocities like this, when they were 30 before, this is a little concerning for a hyperperfusion syndrome uh, in the making because all the, uh, the distal arterioles in the left hemisphere have been dilating as much as possible to make up for this carotid stenosis. And when you suddenly open up the vessel and take that plaque out and you have the floodgates totally open, the arterioles don't change on a dime and clamp down to compensate again. That can actually take days and that's where the patient's at risk for a hyperperfusion syndrome. Uh, they can get headaches and seizures and edema on that side of the head. So blood pressure control becomes very important when you see these kind of features on a, on a TCD. So it gets his endoterectomy. Uh, you're welcome. It's complicated by a huge neck hematoma. Uh, it gets volume overload from the fluids in the OR. It gets an ICU delirium. <laughs> and to make matters even more insulting, he goes into rapid AFib uh, while he's there as well, uh, prompting the question, uh, did we do the right thing uh, in pursuing an endoterectomy for this patient? And I would argue the TCD says yes. Uh, but clearly he had... Uh, the probable cause of at least the strokes on the right side of his, uh, of his, of his brain uh, were cardioembolic, and perhaps the one on the left as well, but I would still argue that his carotid stenosis was high risk for, um, uh, for a stroke uh, as well in the left hemisphere. We're good to keep going? Yeah. And there was there was a case I actually looked at recently as a, as an interpreter that uh, I think it was prompted by your observation that when the blood pressure dropped, the uh, SSCPs uh, dropped out for a patient on the on the one hemisphere, and that prompted us to look at uh, the carotid. Ironically, so with the left arm, the SCPs dropped out on, so they ordered a left carotid. Uh, and so I, I read that and said, yeah, it looks normal, but I think we need to do the other, the other one, too. Uh, no, I know, I know you did not. I did not. It was, it, was, it was an opportunity to teach some neuroanatomy. It was great. Um, I'm going to keep going until uh, the cane comes off and pulls me off the stage. Um, this is a 41 year old guy who had the misfortune at age 20 of having a, uh, a left anterior descending artery dissection that required a stent, and he had a, um, an infarct of his anterior wall when he was young. And as you can see, he had a uh, prior stroke uh, as well, probably related to that. Uh, and now he comes in with right hemiparesis and aphasia. Um, and on this cut of the uh, um, the, uh, the CTA, uh, you can see, the reason I chose these is to, to show you that there's no, uh, there's no carotid siphon on the, uh, the left side, uh, but there is an ACA and an MCA. So he, didn't have, he had an occlusion of the terminal ICA right here. And he had this stroke, which involved the, um, the basal ganglion, and then uh, one kind of M4 branch uh, opercular area, and he had a matched... Uh, core to penumbra on his perfusion imaging. This was his diagnostic angio. Looking from the, the right side, you can see that uh, his ACA uh, nicely fills out both ACA territories and the MCA, and there's no retrograde flow into the, um, into the terminal ICA with that clot is sitting. This is what the right carotid uh, looks like. <clears throat> 
here's what his TCD looked like. Um, so uh, it's interesting if you ignore all, all the embolic signals, uh, which are uh, the most dramatic uh, finding on this study. You can also if you look at the M mode. You can see that on the right side you have the traditional configuration of MCA red toward the probe, ACA away. Uh, and then if you look at this one, it's all red. Uh, it's all toward the probe because of the uh, right to left collateral. So the TCD confirms what you saw in the angio already, but there's tons and tons of, uh, of microemboli. Uh, in a single four second sweep there, there was 70 counted and there was 524 during the first minute of monitoring. So too many to count uh, embolic signals. This, they, interestingly, when, when Merrill was doing the study, every time the patient rolled over and moved, the signals would go up. Uh, so, had a stat echocardiogram. Um, I'm not as fast at reading these, but this is this is the top part of the heart. This is the bottom, and at the apex of the left ventricle, you see this echo density right here. In a cross section, it looks like this. Uh, and there was a apical thrombus um, with normal uh, left LV function, uh, but multiple segmental abnormalities uh, from uh, previous ischemic disease of the heart. Started on a heparin drip, and this is really dramatic. It was not a single embolic signal once the PTTs were uh, therapeutic. Very exciting. Transition to warfarin. He actually got a lot better because he's young and he had a small stroke, uh, and he was discharged to to rehabilitation unit. One more. Or, yeah. Question. So you're calculating flow uh, from velocity. Right? We're extrapolating flow. Yeah. Dependent on radius, I should know this, <laughs> but uh, do you use standard radii for the different vessels, or do you base it on the like, MCA? Because obviously there's going to be variation in radius. So with the velocities, there's just there's normative data on what's what's you know preceding thousands of normal subjects. Right, but the flow. We don't calculate the flow. Just when we make assumptions about what the flow is given the velocities, right? But that is that is one of the uh, but, the limitations uh, of TCD. When you MCA, when we calculate a flow that is uh, lower than the actual, uh, because there's a variance there, that can be pretty significant, right? It can be if you if you have uh, delicate of the intracranial vessels and they're really big and torturous and, and fat. You can see like globally low velocities. If you have one vessel that's like that, you can see that. You can actually detect uh, AVMs because the, uh, the diastole will be so high, it'll be so low resistance because the arteries are pouring right into, the waveform becomes important. Typically the velocities can get higher, but uh, I don't think we're gonna get to this case. One of my last cases is talking about vasomotor reactivity. So if you just hold your breath uh, and increase your PaCO2, You'll see the velocities go up by uh, 20, 30 uh, centimeters uh, per second uh, if, if you have normal vasculature. Uh, and so it's a very dynamic system. Uh, and so there's a range of, of normal because it's responding to how much oxygen is getting downstream and really responding to how much carbon dioxide there is in terms of how those, uh, sphinct those uh, sphincters on the artery side of the, cap the capillary bed are constricting and dilating in response to that microchemical environment. What are the sort of error bars around, let's just say, velocity? Like the, yeah, just overall, you know, someone must have done a large scale study. What sort of variance? So, so uh, comparing it with uh, catheter angiogram, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sensitivity uh, is, uh, is decent uh, in the 90s, the specificity is a little lower. Um, like in the high 80s, based upon the the, the Sonia um, uh, data, uh, it's not bad, but it, it, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty decent rule out intracranial stenosis. Um, and in addition to using the absolute velocities for those vessels and comparing it to normal subject velocities, you can also look at the ratios, homogeneous ratio on the other side, if you know that's uh, normal, uh, and then ratio to adjacent segment. And so if you're calling it greater than 70% stenosis intracranially, you need the velocity to be well over 100 centimeters a second. You need to be three to one um, uh, compared to the adjacent segment, and then uh, greater than 30% compared to the homonymous segment on the other side. So, so there's, there's adjuvant, uh, there's additional criteria uh, 
for calling a vessel severe uh, in addition to just the velocity itself. Yeah, and you also have to say patient's pressure was this, their hematocrit was this, because all those things can affect the velocity as well. And so you have to, in your interpretation, be even-handed about all the uh, milieu you're, you're, you're dealing with. Uh, well, is, it, is, it, is it rap? Is it cane time? It's cane time. Cane time. <laughs> well, stay tuned. There's more. So if, uh, we'll come up for, for part two of the sequel, Avengers 4, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and thanks for incorporating the questions into the, uh, the body of the talk. It's always better that way. Thank you.